Our scripture for today is from two places in Mark, beginning with Mark chapter 9, verses 33 to 37. And that oh, magically appeared on your screen. How about that? And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, if anyone would be the first, he must be the last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. And then in chapter 10, beginning in verse 35, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. And Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to Christ. I'm sure you'll all agree that we do some of our best thinking in the car. And a handful of times I've been driving and it occurs to me that I might be the best pastor in the world. And perhaps the best thing, don't tell anybody I said this, but perhaps the best thing about it is it's not because I think I preached the best sermon. It's usually a combo of things. I preached an above average sermon. I sat with someone and listened to them without interrupting. And I remembered to pray for our elders and staff or something like that. And it cracks me up when it happens because how would we even measure such a thing? And because of texts like this, where Jesus teaches us gently but directly about how we keep score and how not great that is and that the kingdom offers us an alternative. I'm so glad this happened, both in chapter 9 and in chapter 10 of Mark. I'm so glad that these regular guys are having a regular conversation, and Jesus turns it into an object lesson. And a lot of people say that this text is about humility, and I think it is, but both of these texts are about humility, but I think they're also about the mission that the disciples have, which is also our mission. One of the sweetest things about the gospel is not, it is that it not only frees us from our sin, it frees us into the flourishing with God life that is mission. It isn't terribly weird that the disciples uh, asked these questions because um, Jesus had just sent, or had just uh, taken Peter and James and John aside. So it's kind of a natural question, right? Who is the best disciple? It's not weird that they're trying to get around, get, to, to get their heads around the best or who's, who's the best among them because Jesus did talk before this even about um, the greatest in the kingdom. So they, it's not weird that they ask it, though they get to learn. I think there was some bad silence in this moment. You know? You know that time, like... Pe- those of you with kids, you know when they go into another room and they're making the noise you expect them to make? 
and then it's quiet and you're nervous? I think that's what happened. And I love, I love Jesus' question. What were you discussing on the way? I kind of wonder what their conclusions were about who was the best disciple. You know, Peter could make a case. I'm the brash, passionate one, you know. John is, is I think, a more contemplative. He's able to be loved by Jesus. Maybe that makes him the best. Nathan, uh, we already see some evangelism. This is from Mark chapter 3, the list of disciples. Matthew clearly took the best notes on Jesus' ministry. Andrew was pretty steadfast, I think. I think Thaddeus was probably the musician. I'm just making this up at this point. James was the one that uh, was probably confusing because there are a couple of James in the early church, though he was martyred, so some of Jesus' prophecies about him came to true. Philip actually flies in Acts chapter 8. I'm not making that up. I don't think they knew that he was going to be given that. I don't, we don't know if he flies, but the Spirit moved him from one place to another in Acts chapter 8. I think if you can do that, perhaps that's a sign that you're the best disciple. I wonder if Simon told the best parables. Who did they ask for to teach when Jesus was unavailable? I just, I don't even know what their criteria was for who would be the best disciples. But more importantly, I want you to not miss the glimmer in Jesus' eye that I think is clearly here that Peter told Mark about repeatedly when he said, what were you discussing on the way? because he knew, and he turns it into a lesson. But not just that. Then James and John come to Jesus, and they want to circumvent the whole discussion. They want to have a separate discussion about getting to sit at his right and at his left. And this is a, there's a, um, there's a lot of challenges to this text that I'll explain some of, but we could really do a deep dive on this, because on the right and on the left, perhaps was a reference to his crucifixion. But Jesus is also talking uh, in, in end times uh, tone with an eschatological, which means end times tone. Remember, apocalyptic is something being revealed. Eschatology is the, the reference to Jesus' return when he'll make all things new. But James and John want to be at the top of the scoreboard, and they, it almost feels like they're sort of cheating to get there. Um, and I want to ask you this question because I think it's at the heart of the way that, that we do life that is reflected in James and John and previously in all 12 disciples they were discussing it. What if there's actually no score? You know, we all get competitive in our jobs. We get competitive in the way that we view our neighbors and their lives, especially as we perceive them and imagine them, probably not as they actually are. What if there isn't a score? What if there isn't a score that matters? What if real life begins with grace received through faith and not through merit? What if love from God is a gift, the gift, and that we didn't achieve it or earn it? What if we learn to start there? And we're maybe still aware of the score. And you know what I mean when I say the score. The life you have versus the life your neighbors have. What you feel when someone in your place of business talks about their success. When you think you might be the best or perhaps the worst at whatever it is that you do. The disciples are wondering who's the best. James and John want to be seen as the best. They want other people to see them sitting at Jesus' right and left. We keep score all the time in many, many, many ways. I want to know why the disciples are indignant. So Mark learned this story from uh, Peter, who told it a lot. And I wonder if Peter spent more time talking about James and John trying to cheat the who's the best disciple game than he did the argument about who's the best disciple. Why are they indignant? Is it because James and John, frankly, act like kids? Has a kid ever come up to you and said, Mom or Dad, I want you to give me something, or I want you to do something for me, but I want you to agree to do it before I tell you what it is? That's what they did! And Jesus takes this and he not only turns it into a lesson about humility and about leadership, but he eschatologizes this situation. Oh yeah, I said eschatologizes. I'm pretty 
convinced that we're not supposed to use insider language as Christians and we're not supposed, so that people can understand us. I'm, I'm pretty convinced that um, we need to talk like regular people talk. And yet, there are some words that we can learn that can encourage us. So when we need to use words like eschatologizes, which I still am not sure I'm saying correctly, I think it's because uh, we have something extra to notice. So Jesus is taking a very mundane conversation that comes from a place that is in all of us, the desire to, to be the best, even if it's just among a group of three, the desire to do well and, and to succeed. And he turns the tone of it into something that has to do with the end times. And this is where Christianity is, uh, challenges us intellectually because it is grace received by faith through no merit of our own. And yet, how we live matters a great deal. The point is not to get to heaven. The point is to follow Jesus right now. Heaven is a sweet promise, but it is not the point. I do love that they asked Jesus, whatever, will you give me whatever we ask before we tell you what it is. We at least have to admire James and John's ambition and brashness in this moment, don't we? And Jesus teaches in response. And parents, I imagine over the last 10 days, uh, patience has not always been full. I want to point out to you that the first time this happens in Mark 9, Jesus sits down. And he gets them into a circle, I imagine. It doesn't say that, but he sits with them. And the second time, it doesn't record that, right? Because some, perhaps, it doesn't say that Jesus was impatient. It doesn't say that he was upset. It doesn't, but I love, you know, because in our better moments as parents, we get down on their level. We talk to them gently. Tell them your name is... I love you. Nothing will ever change that. But you can't kick your brother. But then the second and the third and the fourth time they do it, we're not as patient. I love that Jesus sits with them, making it very clear that uh, he isn't exalted above them in a human sense, though he is obviously exalted above them. So Jesus turned these odd opportunities the disciples created into lessons. In Mark 1, verse 15, Jesus says that there's a kingdom. And that kingdom, as we sang about a little bit today, and is defined by uh, Romans as the quickest definition of the kingdom, righteousness, joy, and peace of the with God life. Here, Jesus is saying that that kingdom frees us from the tyranny of scorekeeping that the world would put on us, that our false self would tell us is the point of life is to win or to be the best at this or to be the best at this or at least to be better at it than our neighbor or our coworker. The kingdom frees us from the tyranny of scorekeeping into the flourishing of the with God life where we are aware that the score doesn't matter the same way that loving God and worshiping him and caring for the neighbors he's put into our life matters. And increasingly, as we lean into that and remember it as the Holy Spirit grows us, we're less and less aware of the score and less and less dominated by it. The church isn't. And, it, and Jesus is teaching something that is an indictment of the church and clearly a teaching for the church. The church is not to be known for this kind of leadership. This is why when we're with our nominating committee and we're discussing elder, the first question, the first question is, are they humble? And we have different definitions for humility, but we have an instinctive response when someone asks or when we're describing someone or when we're considering whether they're humble. Some of you know that I really love pens. I have these three Parker Jotter pens right here. I have one clipped onto my notebook. I don't know how many of you have had to endure my speeches about the Parker Jotter. I can name 10 movies and a couple of TV shows that it's used in as a form uh, to show the nobility of a character that you might miss. And I was absolutely fascinated by the use of the Jotter in the movie The Two Popes. 
I was thinking about this illustration earlier today. See the jotter? Can you see it on your screen? That's the pen sitting on his desk. And here's the thing. This is a film with a lot of fancy pens. But the jotter comes up when the humanity and the humility of both men is present. I think the only way that uh, I could spoil the movie is by telling you it's really good. I can't think of a movie. To, I don't th- how do you spoil a movie that's about two popes talking? And maybe you don't want to watch it. I do highly commend it. And it's beautiful at this moment in the movie, about 45 minutes in, when the jotter shows up, it's because their humanity and their humility comes up in conversation. Because followers of Jesus have learned a new way. They've learned that keeping score is not only not the flourishing life, but it's bad for the soul. It doesn't deliver. And then they learn to enjoy. Now I think of how I could spoil the movie, but I won't. I encourage you to watch it. The disciples argued, as did James and John. Jesus turned these opportunities into lessons. If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. That word servant is the word we use for deacon. This is one who chooses to put the needs of others in front of their own needs, which doesn't mean you don't have needs. You do. And a flourishing life, abundant life, is found in worshiping God, loving neighbor, and putting their needs ahead of our own. The disciples argued, as did James and John. Jesus turned these opportunities into lessons, and it's about leading also. A lot of people call these uh, sections of Scripture sections on humility, and they are, but they're also about leadership because Jesus is fully assuming that the disciples have a role to play. Jesus is fully assuming that they are going to lead people in understanding the with God life, that they are going to serve Yes, it's about humility. It's also about leadership, and it's also a description of what's available to you in the kingdom. If you are not a Jesus follower, if you're skeptical and thoughtful, I hope that you hear through this teaching, through these interesting stories of first all the disciples discussing who's the greatest, then James and John specifically asking Jesus for something, and then Jesus teaching that the way to be great in a kingdom sense is to learn to love and to serve God and neighbor. And in that offer, do you hear that you are freed from a kingdom of darkness where your only hope is to win? And your only hope is to be at the top of the points chart as a human in your place of business, in your family, on your Instagram feed. And Jesus is saying that his kingdom of light is one where the power of scorekeeping is entirely removed and eventually even our awareness of it shrinks. We're released from it into a stability of soul that only he can give These teachings are guidance to the church, they're indictment to the church, and they are a constant prayer for us. I imagine as many of us learn to work from home more exclusively, our tempers and our patience sometimes get the best of us. Perhaps it's been more challenging this week with your coworkers or with your spouse, with your children or with your parents. Jesus teaches us not only about real greatness, but how to pray about our regular life. Lord, would you grow me up in humility? Humility is not humiliation. They sound so similar and they're so different. Humility is good confidence in who God made you to be where you neither think too highly nor lowly of yourself. You put others' needs in front of your own, but do not forget your own needs. And so I offer to you this teaching, spurred on by the disciples' perhaps silly question, but legitimate question also, and then James and John trying to cheat their way to the top of the points chart, 
offer to you this prayer for your job, for your house, for your relationships. Lord, would you grow me up in humility? Jesus taught directly, it shall not be so among you, which is a command of life to us, to the church, to our families, commend to you this prayer, Lord, would you grow me in humility? Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we believe that you are good and that you see. We ask that we would sense your patient, kind strength in this moment and that it would spur us to humble love for you and for neighbor. Jesus, we ask that by faith you would help us to imagine your tone of voice interacting with your disciples and teaching them about real life. Holy Spirit, comfort and assure us in your love. Cast fear out of our minds and hearts. Teach us to rest in you to celebrate and praise you not only in corporate worship but throughout our week. Amen.